Hey, hey, good morning, good morning. Come on into the house of the Lord. Good morning. My name is Tim Bice. I'm one of the elders, one of the pastors here at Greenbrier Church. And if you are with us for the first time, we are thrilled that you are here. Our hope is that you see and experience and feel and capture the grace of God that every single one of us need. And we want to look at today to open Psalm 147, some selected verses. Listen to some of these verses. Verse 1, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Is that anybody today? Verse 7, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. Verse 10, his delight is not in strength of horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. He's a gracious God. He's kind. And there's one thing that I know that each one of us here today needs, one thing we all have in common, and that is our need for God's grace grace upon grace to wash over us. So if you've come in beat up, God's grace is for you. If you've come in with good news, some in, being encouraged by something that happened, you still need God's grace, and God's grace is for you, and it's for all of us. And the, the one thing I know about God is he is unstoppable when it comes to pouring out his grace. You may think that things in your life have stopped or God has stopped loving you, but I want you to know he's actually unstoppable. He loves you, he's kind towards you, 
and he wants the best for you. That's why he's given to you his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray, and then we're going to worship together. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for giving to us this beautiful gospel that we can trust and believe, the Holy Spirit who makes residence in us, the word of God that you've given to us as a lamp unto our feet. Thank you, God, for being unstoppable in loving us and pouring your grace upon us, and I pray that we understand that and grasp that even more today. As we worship you, as we pray, as we sing, and as we listen to the taught word of God. We love you so much. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together as we sing this morning.
He is unstoppable.
and you carry us along, Father. And I just thank you and praise you for that. God, I pray this morning that we will just fall into your arms of grace and mercy this morning, Father. And that you'll just wrap your arms around us, God. That we can just feel your love today. Lord, so many have walked through these doors today, God. And we don't know what's going on in lives. God, there's so much hurt these days. There's so much um, anger, bitterness, things, emotions that people are walking through, Father. Because... There are things that happen in our life we don't understand, Father. But God, you are a good, good Father. And God, you just promise to never leave us and forsake us and to walk us through all of these times in our life, Father. But God, you are Lord, and you are the only God in our lives, Father. And we tend to try to to take that upon ourselves, Lord. And I just pray today, Father, that we will realize, God, that you are the one, the only God that can carry us through anything in our lives. Help us as we listen to your word today, Father. Open our physical ears. Lord, just open our heart to receive the message that we're to hear today, Father. And God, I pray that we will not walk away the same. God, that there will be something that is flickered in our hearts and lives, God that we will never be the same when we walk out today after hearing this message. We love you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please remain standing for the word. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. You may be seated. See each and every one of you. My name is Tim Bice. I am one of the pastors, one of the elders here at Greenbrier Church. Today's a special day for us. Uh, and before we get into this book of Romans, I just want to make two quick announcements. Um, the first one I want you to know and remind you of if you're a member, a partner of Greenbrier Church, we have a, a meeting today, a partner meeting afterwards where we're going to eat, have some fellowship, listen to some good things that have happened in the past, what's, and, and, and what's coming up. And uh, we have a big reveal something that we're revealing that's new. It's going to be great. Uh, And then we have a huge announcement, and I can't wait to share those with you. Uh, The next thing I want to remind you of is our student um, auction that we have. It's an annual auction. Most of you have been a part of that. It's so much fun. Uh, We laugh, we cut up, we eat, and we raise money for our students for their student camp. And so if you want to participate in that, we want you to definitely do that. Also, if you've got a business or if you just want to donate something um, individually, please let us know if there's anything that you'd like to give to this auction as we raise money for our students. If you know Erwin Thomas, you can get with him directly, or not, you can go to our Next Steps table right in the middle of the lobby, and they can help you out. But today starts the book of Romans. Man, I can't believe it. Look, I thought I was going to be 70 years old before I was able to dive into the riches and depths of the theology of this book. Uh, However, I did the book of Revelations verse by verse, and I feel like if I can do that, I can do this, right? Um, And so what we're going to do today is we're just going to look at at this thing kind of generally. We're going to do a general introduction, which is going to take most of our time, but we are going to look at verse 1. So we've entitled this something very creative and out of the box, Romans. <laughs> Unashamed, the righteous shall live by faith. Um, I think that's pretty close to what the scriptures say, right? Now, John Piper talked through the book of Romans, and it took him eight years. Yep, Martin Lloyd-Jones did it in 12. But I don't want to do that to you, okay? Uh, so Jay's uncle Steve, he lives in, in, in Mitchell County, and uh, he goes to the Winn-Dixie there in Camilla. You know what he calls the Winn-Dixie there? Hotel California. He said, man, you can check in, but you just can't ever check out. And I don't want <laughs> this book of Romans to be like Hotel California. You're like, dude, we checked in, but I don't feel like we're ever checking out. Uh, so hopefully we'll get done in about two years, um, something like that. But it doesn't matter how long we do this. Look, the book of Romans is always going to be a life-giving gift to you as long as you're alive, all right? Uh, but we, we, we're going to divide it into four parts, and we'll take a break between each part. 
So today, of course, we start part one. Part one includes chapters one through four. It's all about salvation by faith alone. We'll take a break in the summer, come back in the fall to start part two, which would be chapters five through eight, our new life in Christ. We'll take some time at the beginning of the year, do some things in the spring of 25. We'll hit chapters 9 through 11, God's faithfulness and redemptive history. So if you're, you know, all ready for the, the chapter on election, you've got to wait a year. Uh, <laughs> chapters 12 through 16, uh, we'll finish up. Um, that's the, just the practical vision of the Christian life. And so that's, that's the, 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 how we're going to follow this book. That's how we're going to do it. But let's go ahead and not waste any time and jump right in. Let's pray this morning. Father, give us grace to hear your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would illuminate your word, that you would apply it to our hearts, and that we would live it out. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps no other book in all the Bible has had a greater impact in the world than this epistle to the Romans. Most of you probably have heard of Augustine or Augustine, however you want to pronounce his name. He's an early church father and theologian from the 4th and 5th century. Incredible influence in Western Christianity. He's written over 5 million words in commentaries and sermons and books. The reformers of the Protestant Reformation would look to him for theology. He's just been so influential, but that had not always been the case for Augustine. He lived a pretty wild and riotous life until the age of 32. In his own confessions, he said he was pretty much a womanizer, a drunkard, that he would follow pagan philosophies and even debate them until one day, he says, he flung himself under a fig tree and wept. He was like, why do I keep sinning? Why do I keep putting off following Jesus and following the Lord. Why, why do I keep putting it off till tomorrow? And, and he's having this moment with God, and he's weeping, and all of a sudden he hears children sing, and they, he hears, take it and read, take it and read. He said, I've never heard that song before, and I've never heard it after. But he felt like it was from the Lord. He jumped up, and he took the Bible and read, randomly opening to Romans. Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, he read this. Not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries. Rather, arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. And this is what he said in his autobiography called Confessions. He says, I had no wish to read more. No need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. Augustine was marked by the book of Romans. And whether you know it or not, your Christian life has been marked by Augustine. And I also want you to know, as we go through this book, through this letter together, my hope, my prayer is that Greenbrier Church and all who attend will be marked by this book. We'll see God for who he is, what he has done, who we are in him, and then faithfully living out the lives he's called us to live out. Romans has had that great impact on the world, and I hope it does on us as well. So the book of Romans is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Now, this is a church that he did not plant, he did not start. Most likely, it was started by converts from the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Jewish folk going to Jerusalem for the, this feast, hear the gospel, moved by the Holy Spirit, converted, go back to their home city of Rome, and start a church. It became really diverse with both Jews and Gentiles, that's non-Jew. And Paul is writing a letter to them because he's heard of not only their faith, but also some things that are going on in the church. 
Now, by the time that Paul writes this letter, he's been a gospel preacher for about 20 years. Acts 21 says he's in the city of Corinth for like three months, and he sits down and he writes this letter. And then he sends this letter by the hands of a woman, a deaconess named Phoebe. What a gift, right? Hey, I got something for you. What is it? It's the book of Romans. Here you go, right? And so they open the pages They read, they know what it means. They know everything this letter means because it was meant for them. And for us, for you and me, as we look at a book like this, a letter like this, we need to know what that is. We we also need to be able to look through those lenses. Have you ever gone to a 3D movie and then you're sitting and you're trying to watch it and it's only until you put the 3D glasses on that it becomes three-dimensional, right? And it makes more, it's more clear, you can see things better. That's what I hope to do. By asking these three questions, I hope we can see this letter in a 3D fashion where it's more clear to us. Here are the three questions I want to answer today. What's the purpose of Romans? What's the thesis of Romans? And what should we expect as we, as a church, study the book of Romans? So let's ask those now. What's the purpose of Romans? Well, Paul never went there, right? He didn't start this church. But he knows what's going on, and here's what he knows. In A.D. 49, Claudius, who was the emperor of Rome, the Roman Empire, kicked out all of the Jewish people from the city of Rome. Their void caused someone else to take up leadership. Who? The Gentiles. Everything changed. Claudius died in A.D. 54, All this is in history, too, by the way, which matches the Bible. Uh, We even see it in Acts chapter 18, 1 and 2, with Priscilla and Aquila being kicked out of Rome, right? But when, when, when the Jewish folk come back after Claudius has died, they find their church way different than they left it. It would almost be like you leaving your house in the hands of someone else that's maybe a different culture than you, raised differently than you, and you go overseas for about five or six years, and you come back to see your house completely different than the way that you left it. That's what happened here. No longer are they gathering in synagogues. They're now gathering in houses, house churches. Not only that, but there are a lot of cultural practices now that the Gentiles are doing that's very offensive to the Jewish Christians. That's why we see Paul addressing these things in chapter 9 through 11, chapters 14 and 15. So most likely they come into this Gentile-led majority church with significant changes in leadership and in practice. And Paul's like, I've got to write to them about unity. I I need to help them get back together. And when you read the book of Romans with those 3D lens, it's very helpful for you to understand. So what does Paul say to them about Unity. How are they going to get on the same page? How are two ethnicities, two different cultures, two different kinds of people who wouldn't be friends, much less family, without something to unify them, what is it that's going to unify them? It's the gospel. This letter is gospel saturated through and through from chapter 1 to chapter 16. So the answer of what is the purpose of Romans is this. Only the gospel will bring unity to Jews and Gentiles in the church of Rome. And it also means that only the gospel will bring unity to you and I in Greenbrier Church. Second question. What's the thesis of Romans? Thesis, you know what that is, right? I mean, it's just, if you, if you remember anything about English, it's just a statement that offers like a concise summary of the main point. Right? That's all it is. And Romans 1, 16 through 17, is the summary statement for all of the book of Romans. Paul spends the rest of his time unpacking this sentence. It's the thesis. Let's look at it together. Romans 1, 16 through 17. Now, I'm not going to preach this text today, but we do have to get an overview so we can understand the book of Romans. I'm going to preach this text, 16 and 17, on Easter, actually, Easter morning, Two services, 9 and 11. I'm going to write that down, put that in your calendar. Let's look at it, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because that's what unifies them. Then he gives two aspects of this gospel. He says, for it, the gospel, 
is the power of God for salvation to everyone who puts their faith, their trust, who believes this gospel. First, of course, to the Jew, then to the Greek, that is, the Gentile. That's one aspect. The gospel is the power of God that saves sinners. Second part, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God, or better yet, righteousness that comes from God because he is righteous, is revealed from faith for faith, from the beginning to the end of your life. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. One of the things we're going to look at throughout this whole book is this one word, righteousness. If you could just say one word to describe Romans, it would be righteousness. It's throughout the whole book. He's like the righteous are living by faith, believing this gospel. And gospel, we'll get into detail throughout this letter, but let me just at least give us something, an inkling of what it is. Gospel simply means, it literally means news. And God is a news giver. He is declaring his news that his son saves sinners, forgives them, gives them his righteousness, and eternal life. And the very gospel that saves us when we believe it is also the gospel that we live by every single day. The just, the righteous shall live by faith. Not just be saved, but live by faith. I wasn't going to share it, but I think I'm going to go ahead and share it. This might help us as well. Ray Ortland, I think, has a really good definition of, of the gospel John, if you didn't delete it, I told him, I was like, you may want to delete that. Now I'm going to use it. But here we go. God, through the perfect life, atoning death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, rescues all his people from the wrath of God into peace with God with a promise of the full restoration of his created order forever. All to the praise of the glory of his grace. That's Ray Ortland's definition, and I think it's a pretty good one. And in, in believing this gospel, that God gives us something called righteousness. Power to save us, yes. But the other aspect is righteousness. It seems to be the theme that comes from this thesis of the book of Romans. What does it mean? What is righteousness? I know when I first got saved... Uh, some of you know my testimony. I was a pretty crazy guy, pretty wild. And uh, I got saved, and God radically changed my desires. And I hung out with some old friends. You know what they called me? Mr. Righteous. And it was great. I loved it, right? But I think that's what we think of is like, oh, yeah, Mr. Righteous, you know, goody two-shoes. But l- let me try to explain what righteousness really is. It's, it's a right standing with God. It's, being, it's having a right orientation toward God and with God. It's a judicial declaration. It's about following and fulfilling the law, God's law. The law is God's standard. Let me just try to set it up this way. Righteousness means I've done everything, God, your law has commanded of me and demanded me. Everything that you want, I've done Therefore, now I am in right standing with you. How many of you know you've blown that a long time ago? There's no, there's no one, not one, who has a status of good deeds and obedience to go to God and say, look at me. I'm in your presence. None of us are righteous. That's one of the first things that Paul starts out in the next verse, verse 18. He's like, all right, nobody's righteous. Gentiles, unrighteous. Jews, yeah, unrighteous. Chapter 3, everybody, unrighteous. (laughs) That's all of us. Which puts us in a precarious situation, right? 
Without righteousness, we don't have a relationship with God. We don't have his presence. We can't, we can't be with him. Therefore, our need to believe this gospel and in it, God gives us this right standing, this righteousness. Um, let me say it this way. This, let me contrast righteousness with something like, do you know what regeneration is? It's, 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 it's when God saves us and he does a work in us. He makes us new. Um, he gives us his Holy Spirit. He awakens us. He gives life to us. He regenerates us. That's something God has done in us. Righteousness is different. Righteousness is something God has done for us. It's judiciary. It's like a ledger sheet. He's like, I've, I've made you right. I've declared you right. I've given you, given you righteousness. For example, um, say a, a, a surgeon who goes in and takes out cancer or your appendix or whatever and brings healing, like the surgeon goes in. That's like regeneration. But a judge does the declaring. Right, wrong, guilty, not guilty. Righteousness has to do with being declared by the great judge either unrighteous or righteous. And then he's saying right here, everyone's unrighteous, but we have to find somehow a way for this judge, good judge and a good father, but judge, to declare us righteous so that we can be in his sight. When Jay and I first got into ministry, my wife Jay and I got into ministry, man, we were ignorance on fire. Amen? Anybody else? Good Lord, have mercy. And uh, we had a guy come into our church, our first church. He was converted. I baptized him, and then we tried to help him. We gave him a room to stay in at our house, and then we helped him get a business started. And <laughs> what I mean by that, it was in my name. I know, I was in my 20s. Don't judge me yet. Um, one day... I get a call from code enforcement. This was a, this was a, a business that uh, he did a lot of contract work, like on houses and things like that. Mr. Bice, yes, sir, you're in trouble. I'm like, oh, gosh, <laughs> what do you mean? And he explained to me that this person we were helping took a lot of money from people. And I told him my story. I said, well, look, here's how this happened. He's like, son, you need to come see me right now. Bring your checkbook. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. So Jay and I jump in the car, go downtown Albany, meet with the code enforcement guy. He says, do you know who this guy is that you're trying to help? I'm like, yeah, it's a brother in Christ. You know, <laughs> Baptized him, man. He's, he said, let me show you something. You know what a rap sheet is? It's a criminal record. Right? I think rap stands for report of arrests and prosecutions. Can I tell you it was long? He said, let me just show you. It goes all the way back to the 70s. I'm like, oh, Lord, how Jesus. <laughs> what? And he just goes on and on and on. He said, Mr. Bice, you've been conned. I'm like, conned for Jesus. Great. <laughs> Trying to help somebody. And we wrote a big check. He did take care of us. He understood. He believed that we were trying to help the guy. But, man, what a disaster. But you know what? In the sight of God, your rap sheet was way longer than our friends. Your offenses and treasons and crimes against the God of the universe goes on and on and on, not just to the 70s, but to the beginning of your life, actually beyond that to Adam. You have a long criminal record. Yet, by the goodness and kindness of God, he sent his son Jesus to make atonement for that criminal record to die on a cross in your place for forgiveness of sin, that he, by his blood, would wipe your record clean and nail it to the cross. But that gets you forgiven. You're still not righteous. You're only neutral. That gets you to where Adam was before he sinned. Is there anything that you can bring to God in a neutral position to say, I'm so righteous. No. Let me give you another story, maybe to help us understand what this righteousness is. So when I was in third grade, we had a math teacher, uh, Miss Edie. 
Uh, she was a really great math teacher. And I was a math nerd, believe it or not. Um, and I wonder, like, sometimes I'm like, God, why do, why do I have a mathematical mind when I'm a preacher? Like, I should be good at English and writing and reading. And I wasn't that good at those things, but I could solve some math problems. <laughs> but this lady, she was such a good teacher. Have you ever done the time test? Like the addition and multiplication of the time test? Anybody done those? Let me see. I'm just curious. When you were in school, or maybe, oh, yes, you understand this. Great. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know, this was back in the 80s, so memory's a little fuzzy. Um, I th- she would give us, like, uh, uh, addition first. And she would give us, like, sheets of paper, and there'd be, like, 100 problems, addition problems on there. You had to do them all in, like, three minutes. And I think you could only miss one, if I'm, if I'm thinking rightly. But every time you did it, when you finally got to the point where you did the whole sheet, you got a star. And she had a piece of construction paper pinned on the wall with your name on it. It was yellow. I'll never forget it. And I remember going up there with others, and, you know, little by little, we were all putting stars up there. And I finally got five stars from addition worksheets. And then I moved on to the big boys. Multiplication, right? We did the multi- same deal. 100 problems, three minutes, can't miss but one. And we, I finally got to, okay, I've got one. And, and I was like at the top, I was close to the top of the class, actually. And I was putting my stars up there. Just so happens the salutatorian and the valedictorian both were in this class. Needless to say, I did not beat them. <laughs> but both of them were girls. They were both named Mary, which is crazy too. But they were both girls. And when they finally got their fifth star on the multiplication, they put it on the bulletin board, on the yellow construction paper. It started to make sense for everybody else in the room. Miss Edie cut out that construction paper into the shape of a crown, like wrapped it around, laminated it, had wrote queen on theirs, laminated it, and gave it to them. And they would wear their queen hats in class. I'm like, okay. I may not be the first one to get the crown, but I'm going to be the first king, I'm telling you. And I did, man. Like, I went home and studied. I was doing everything. Yeah. Sure enough, I made it. The first king. Freaking King Timmy right here, baby. <laughs> I, was so, I was so excited. It gave me a status because of accomplishment. I could go to Miss Edie. She was proud of me. Look, you're the first king, right? I'd wear that sucker on my head in class like a goober, right? Why? Because I earned something. It was good. But we have a greater king who's earned something that we can't. He has fulfilled the law. He's obeyed the law. He was sinless. And the good news for you and me is 2 Corinthians 5.21. I'll paraphrase. The one who knew no sin the one who was king, he made a great exchange with you and I, as Luther said. Give me your sin. I'll take it upon myself. I'll pay the price from the Father so that you would go free, but not just that. Now, let me give you something that I earn. Here's my crown of righteousness. This changes your status. You are honored before God the Father. You don't have a rap sheet, and you now also have a list of goodness that Jesus has earned from 33 years of living sinless. It belongs to you. God the Father sees your righteousness not as though you earned it, but he sees the righteousness Jesus earned as now belonging to you. It's on your record. It's on the ledger sheet. You're no longer in the red. You're in the black. You can now have a right standing, a right position to God. You can be in his presence. You can be with him forever. He honors you. He's proud of you because of Jesus. That's what righteousness is. And then he says this. Now that that's your new identity, live by believing that it's true. This gospel that has the power to save you. This gospel of God that gives you righteousness. That's how you live 
the rest of your life is through that kind of righteousness. The answer to the thesis is Romans 1, 16 through 17. The big idea of today's sermon even is the righteous shall live by faith. Last question. What's expected result from studying Romans? So when Paul went to different places, he would always face different kinds of groups of people that had different sort of groups of beliefs, rules of life, different philosophies and different religions. And he's like, I'm not ashamed of my rules of life. I'm not ashamed of my belief in this gospel. As a matter of fact, I'm proud of it, not in a prideful way, but I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed that he's made me righteous. I'm not ashamed that he saved me. And we too, in the day in which we live, we, we do and we will encounter other groups that would shame us for our belief in this gospel. At times, there'll be political groups shaming you for not believing like they do. It could be philosophical or religious. It could be groups with sexual orientation or gender identities. The list goes on and on and on. And as you stand firm, believing this truth of this gospel, you will be shamed, but you never have to be ashamed of this gospel, okay? Why? Because it's the power to save you. And God in all of his goodness has made you righteous before him. So the answer to the question, what do we hope to learn or gain from this book? And it's this. We live by faith in the God of the gospel who gave us righteousness in which we are not ashamed, unashamed, that the righteous shall live by faith. Now, let's look at verse 1. That was a Sunday school lesson. Uh, all we're going to do is just co cover verse 1 today. Let's look at it together. I want you to know that as we read verse 1, as we study this, as we pull out some things, the very gospel that Paul believed in that saved him and he lives by is the same exact gospel that you and I believed in to be saved by, and to live by. It's the same one. What's true for Paul here is also true for us. So let's look at it together. Romans 1, 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Three simple points that match each of these three aspects of Paul's identity in the Lord, living by faith. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, leads us to point number one. Point number one is this. Those who live by faith are servants of Christ. Do you know what that means? It means you've been bought. It means you are owned. And it means that you are ruled. Now, how many of you like that? Many of us don't like to be owned or ruled. But that's exactly who we are as servants of Christ. Well, I don't want to be ruled by anyone. I, I, I don't want to be owned by anyone. Here's what I need you to know. By virtue of being alive, you are already a servant, owned and ruled by either something or someone. It's a universal law that you cannot get around. It works like this. You will serve whatever or whomever you believe will give to you satisfaction or power or comfort, right, or ease or pleasure. What, and, and you will bow down and obey everything it tells you to do so that you can have it. Money's a great example. If you believe that money will give you all that your heart desires, you'll do anything it says in order to have it, including sinning. You're already serving something. All of us are serving something or someone. What is it in your life? Could it be something like money, power, security? In other words, man, I'm okay now. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be happy. 
You know, it could be something like popular, popularity, approval, status. I don't, have to ha- I don't have to be shamed anymore. I don't have to feel the shame anymore now that, I'm, now that I can belong somewhere. Now that, right? It could be comfort, pleasure, substances, sex, living for the weekends. It could be independence or autonomy. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's happened before. I'll never let that happen again. It could be video games, social media, dopamine drips of any kind, escape, alternate reality. Some of these things are not bad either. Did you notice that? Some of these things are actually good. I think vacations are pretty good. I kind of like the weekends. There's some other things I like, but there are kids in here. I won't say that, but they're not necessarily bad. Good things, become, when, good things become destructive when we make good things God things, when we bow down to serve them and try to find our ultimate identity in them or our ultimate comfort, our ultimate happiness in. And Paul is like, man, I'm finding all that in Christ and whom I serve. He's the one that I serve. And if we're, live, if we're righteous people made righteous by Christ, and we're living and believing that, believing the gospel, then we are servants of Christ too. And you know what? I think I'm okay being bought, owned, and ruled by someone who gave his life for me, someone who's kind and gentle and lowly, someone who has my interests at heart, someone who loves me infinitely. I think I'm good with that. But here's the deal. Look at, look at Romans 6, 16 through 18. Paul lays out that you, all of us are servants to something. He says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. I love this part. Listen closely. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. We're all servants. Be a servant of righteousness, not a servant of sin. Paul's no longer a slave to sin, neither are we. But he uses a a word here for servant, um, doulos, and it means a bond servant or a bond slave, some translations say. And we can find what a bond servant or a bond slave is by going to the Old Testament. You look at Exodus 21 or Deuteronomy 15, and it's pretty interesting. And by the way, just a side note, that the slavery we see in the Bible is not the slavery most of us know about today in context of our history or sex slaves today. That's sinful, and it's horrific. That kind of slavery is the kind where a person is stolen and uh, made subservient to another's own desires and will. That's, the Scripture calls that sin. These slaves here in the Old Testament was way different. In Israel, the Hebrew people is more like an indentured servant or maybe even like the military. They would serve for six years. On the seventh year, they were all set free. We find that in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 18. But the cool thing is the end of that time of serving in the seventh year, a servant or a slave could say, you know what? True freedom for me is to stay in my master's house. He's kind, he's loving, I have all my needs taken care of. This is where I want to be. I will be a bond slave. I'm giving my life to this master for the rest of my life. And they would take this servant and they would put his ear to like a doorpost and they would take an owl, A-W-L, a drill, and they would drill and pierce that person's ear and they would mark that servant. And that mark would be a representation that he belongs to this master forever for anyone who saw it, including when he himself saw this piercing That's what Paul is saying. I've discovered a master who's good, who is kind, where I have the most freedom. 
is actually being a bond slave to this master. I'd rather stay here than be free and go out into the world on my own. I choose this. I want this. I desire this. I want to be a servant to Christ forever. And he, his life is marked with servanthood, is yours. If you're a believer of Christ, if you follow Jesus, if you believe the gospel, is Jesus your master? Does it make you happy to serve him? Primarily by serving his people, by the way. Do you serve you or do you serve Christ? I want you to know Christ is much better. And that's where you'll find true freedom. Look at the second part. Call to be an apostle. Which leads us to point two. Those who live by faith have been called by Christ. Now, I want to talk about two different kinds of calls here. I really wish I could almost do a whole sermon on this, but I can't. But let me try to go quickly so we can get our heads wrapped around this. Because there's a lot of debate about calling, whether someone's called or not, whatever. I do see two kinds of calls in the scriptures. One is a kind of call about who you are and your work of holiness, your call to God, you're called by God to be a believer, to be adopted, those sorts of things. For example, we have an upper call in Christ to be with Jesus and to be like Jesus, Philippians 3.14. We've been called to freedom, not bondage, Galatians 5.13. God has saved us and called us to a holy calling, 2 Timothy 1.9. He's called us to his own glory and excellence, 2 Peter 1.3. We could go on and on. I think that's one kind of call, and it has to do with who we are. But it seems to me Paul is talking about a different kind of call from God according to what we do. In other words, okay, I'm a servant of Christ. If I live by faith, I'm a servant. Okay, then what do I do? I don't know. What has he called you to do? Paul uses this a lot in his letters and when he opens up and introduces himself, Paul, an apostle by the will of God, or Paul, an apostle of God, Paul, an apostle to the Gentiles. Not only that, we see that there's a calling of this sort in Hebrews chapter 5 with Aaron, Hebrews 5, 4, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was, so there's a call for him to be a priest. We see uh, Paul talking to the Colossians in Chapter 4, verse 17, he says, And say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I don't know what you want to call this. We can call it a call, or you can call it like whatever you're doing for the Lord. I don't know. But I do believe if you're serving, he is calling you. And I love how the Reformers took this idea and they says, You know what? It's not that you have one call. You had a bunch of calls. Some of you have a call to your family. Some of you are called to be dads and husbands. Some of you are called to be moms and wives. We're called to be a blessing to our community. Some of you serve on boards in our community. We're also called to serve our local church. By the way, we need kids, volunteers. Can I get a witness? Well, I can't do all of it. The reformers thought you could. Maybe we think we're called to vacations and hobbies. None of those things are bad, right? But if they're robbing us from serving the local church, I think we're in trouble. So let, let me talk about it this way, too, because for some of us, our primary call is actually our vocation. I think sometimes we think, well, if I'm going to be in ministry, then this call has to be. I've got to be a preacher or a missionary. I've got to be an elder. I've got to be a deacon. And that may be true. But he's also called some of you to be a banker, a lawyer, a mechanic, a salesperson, a clerk. The list goes on and on and on. Here's the thing. Whatever your calling is, at the root of it, should be, I am doing this as a call to be a blessing to serve other people. That's it. Your job should not just be a job. It should be a vocation. And that, as a matter of fact, it's the Latin word for call, right? This is where we get the word vocation from. That if you are living by faith, it should be showing up in your day-to-day -day job. 
your vocation. That's what your call is. It's not limited to that, but it's definitely not more than that, right? It's, we're called to be blessings to other people. How do I know what my call is? What, what, how do I know what this is, or what these calls are even? God, what, are, what does this mean for me? How do I live this out? I'm going to give you two ways to try to figure out what these call or calls are in your life. I'm going to give you a bonus one as well. <laughs> the first one is this inner conviction. Like, I have a passion for this to teach the kids or to do surgery or to sell stuff or whatever it is. Like, I, I just had this inner conviction to be at home with my kids as, a, as a working in the home. What, what is it? What's, what's this inner conviction? Then there should be something that comes alongside of that, an outer commendation from others. You're a really good mom. You know, or, hey, don't worry so much about trying to provide for It looks like God's providing for you. If you feel like you're led to stay home, I, I think you'd be a great stay-at-home mom. Or it may be like, man, like, I think you'd be a great doctor. I think you'd be a great preacher or teacher. Man, I think you'd be a great deacon to lead. Looking out for outer commendation from this inner conviction. And if you want a bonus point here, <laughs> a third thing, it'd be like the position opens up or the opportunity actually opens up and you step into it, right? That would be kind of like the third part. Look for opportunities. Look for those kinds of things. All right, third one. Set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart for the gospel of God, which leads to point three, final point. Those who live by faith have been set apart by Christ. I'm a servant. This is what I'm called to do. Now I can expect God to take me out of the circulation of common things and put me in the circulation of him leading me to serve others, to serve Christ, right? Think about the, the utensils in the temple. Like they were no longer common when they were consecrated. <laughs> and they were there to serve a purpose, to, 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 to worship God and to show the sacrifice in the temple made for atonement of sin. Like there was purpose. And some of you, when you say, I'll serve God, and you start to feel this inner conviction to be called by God, and people are commending you, and you've got opportunity, then the Lord comes in and does what? He sets you apart to do it. He enables, he opens the doors, he makes it happen. That's what Christians do, right? And this is how it worked for Paul, Acts 13 too. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, that's Paul, for the work to which I have called them. In this case, the church was praying. The church was fasting and God used the church to set them apart, to do the call to serve the Lord, right? That is what a life that is surrendered to the Lord, believing the gospel, understanding that you're righteous before him, looks like. And it's kind of simple. It's kind of like this, really. If I could just sum it all up, it's kind of like this. Lord, here I am. Really, you've done all this for me? I don't have to earn this righteousness. You've earned it for me. I don't have to live for this righteousness. To be righteous before you, you've lived it for me and you've given it freely to me just by trusting you and believing you? You've saved me from your wrath? You love me? I'm here for you. My life for you, my, love, my life for others. Here I am, send me. Here I am, use me. Here I am, take me. That's what Paul is saying in this first verse. That's what he's saying has happened to him. Has it happened to you? Have you said, yes, Lord, I'm willing? I'm willing to serve you. I'm willing to answer the call. And I'm willing to be sent out. I hope so. And in conclusion, just want you to, rem to, to remember this. From start to finish, if you've believed the gospel, you are set apart to live it, to proclaim it. It never changes. Once you're set apart, you're always set apart. 
He's made you righteous. The righteous live by faith, believe, trust in this beautiful gospel, this news that's been broadcast to us. In that very gospel, we're never ashamed of. We're actually proud, not in a prideful way. And when we're shamed, we never have to be ashamed of this gospel that we believe in and live by. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us, caring for us, showing us all that you have in your word. we excited about this book that we get to dive into, to learn from. Lord, I pray that it is a huge blessing to this congregation, all who listen, and to me. <laughs> Lord, as you shape me and work in me, and I'm grateful, Lord, for all of these things. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's what we're going to do. We have a, some more good news. We have a baptism this morning. It's a public, yep, public declaration um, of the gospel and belief in the gospel. And, um, but we're going to sing it two songs, and during this time, it's a time of response and to reflect, and if you want to pray here, even on these steps at the altar, or we'll have our prayer team in the back, they'll have lanyards on that says prayer team, they'll be in these two corners waiting for you if you need prayer this morning as we sing these two songs, and then we're going to go into our baptism, okay, and with that, let's all stand together.
will follow you This world has nothing for me Thank you, church family, and thank you, worship team. My name is David Goodson, and I'm here this morning to uh, lead us uh, in uh, an ordinance that we celebrate every week. We either do communion, or we celebrate the Lord's Supper and remember Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, or we celebrate baptism, and we still celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And this morning, we uh, get to do baptism. So in just a few moments, you are going to not only get to watch a video, but you're going to get to see Collins Norris be baptized. And she's going to be baptized this morning by her parents, Jason and Casey. And what I like to tell people about baptism is baptism is a symbol. It doesn't save us. But it is, it is a command that we are called to follow through for all who are followers of Christ. We're called to be, bab we're called to be baptized. And that baptism, again, is a symbol. It's, it's not unlike my wedding band. My wedding band does not save me. But it is a, like if I take it off of my finger, I'm still married to my wife, right? But it is a symbol to everybody that sees it to know that I am married. I have somebody that is mine. And baptism is very much that same thing for us. It's a, it's a symbol. And so this morning, as we watch Collins be baptized, um, I want you to think about not only Collins and celebrate with her, but I want you to think like the Puritans, uh, they, they use this term, called improving your baptism and we think that's kind of funny like how do you improve your baptism like it's nothing better than being saved by Christ right you can't improve upon that and all the things that come with it but this morning the way that we improve our baptism is not only by watching and celebrating with Collins but it's by remembering your own baptism like everybody in here who has followed Christ, hopefully you have been baptized. And maybe if not, you're going to be convicted to go like, I need to follow through in that. But if we're a follower of Christ, we need to like reflect on all the goodness, all the benefits, all the blessings Tim just talked about in the gospel. Like these are ours. And that's how you improve your baptism. You're remembering firsthand how God has been so faithful to walk you through life and bring you to the place that you are today. So as we watch Collins be baptized today, we're seeing a picture, or I use it with kids, I say just a really short movie that reveals how she was once without Christ, and when she goes under the water, it's how Christ has washed all of her sins, has brought her regeneration, and she comes up out of that water, and she is new in Christ. 
Like this is her new person in Christ. It's who she is in Christ. And so consider today, not only as you watch that, but how Christ also has changed you. So as a way to remind ourselves of what baptism is, we like to recite our baptism catechism together. And this is even helpful for the kids who actually came into our service today to observe Colin's baptism. And after we read this together, you're going to see a short video of Colin's testimony. And then together, we will observe and celebrate. And we're known for celebrating baptisms around here, right? All right, we can hoop and holler and be super excited about what Christ has done in Colin's life. But after that, she's going to be baptized by her parents. So if you'll see the baptism catechism on the screen and read that along with me. So what is baptism? Baptism is a holy ordinance in which immersion in the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit signifies our being joined to Christ and our sharing the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. Thank you. Hi, my name is Collins Norris, and this is my story of how I wanted to give my life to Jesus Christ and be saved. So it all started after I went to vacation Bible school last summer, and I feel like after that week of BBS, I had so many questions about God and the Holy Spirit, and that's when I started to feel God working in my heart. And so I would always go up to my parents and ask them a bunch of questions about salvation, the Holy Spirit, and so much more. So I'd ask them the questions, then it would turn into a whole conversation. So I would do that about 10 or 11 nights a month. And one night I realized that there was a gap between me and God, but Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself because we are sinners and he could bridge that gap between me and God. And because of that, I wanted to surrender my life to him by inviting Jesus into my heart and become a child of God. So I prayed with my parents that night, and now I want to spend more time praying and reading the Bible and just talking to God. So I'm really excited to be getting baptized today and to be getting to share my new identity in Christ. Jason, this is my beautiful wife, Casey, and our beautiful daughter, Collins. Um, if there's one thing Casey and I kind of wanted to express, it's just how amazing and incredible it's been to see God truly change the desires of Collins' heart over the last six to eight months. She started asking us questions, and we started seeing changes well before she prayed the prayer, but it's been truly amazing. It just shows how good God is. So, Collins, do you do you ex profess to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I do. Then it is my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to new life. All right, let's all stand together and praise God in this moment and his promises that he will, <laughs> he's there. He is unstoppable and he is true.
coming to the time of our service where we give you've heard us say things like this we give because God gave that's our motive that's what's behind our, our giving I think today in light of what we've seen in Romans is that we're already declared righteous doing right deeds by faith and so now we live out what God has already said about us <laughs> and we're generous like he is we're givers like he is and as the ushers come forward, uh, I want you to know there are, are a few ways. Y'all can go ahead and come up. There are a few ways to pray. Um, a few ways to pray. Did I just say that? There are a few ways to pray. There's a few ways to give. Uh, you see those on the screen uh, behind me? Those are some of the ways that we can give. Uh, we'll go ahead and pray, and then we're going to talk about our mission moment for this, this month. Father, thank you, Lord, for providing everything that we need for life and godliness. You also make provision for us in every area of our lives. I pray that we would, by faith, live out this righteous life you've called us to by being generous like you are. You've been so generous to us. And I pray that we would be generous to see others come into your kingdom, uh, see others hear this precious gospel that you died for. We thank you for this, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So each month we have a mission moment where we highlight either a ministry that's local 
to our area or a church plant that we support or an international church plant that we are supporting. This month, the month of, month of March, we're going to highlight our local Young Life. So as many of you know, we have one of our partners, Angie Elliott, who's the area lead of Young Life and also Young Lives here in Albany and Lee. Um, their mission is to introduce adolescents to Jesus Christ and to help them walk in their faith. And it's pretty simple, and they do a good, a good job at that in our, our community. Uh, so this chapter actually in Albany began in 1993, and Young Lives, which is for teen moms, uh, came into existence in 2019, which Angie also launched that as well. So I think most of you guys are familiar at least with Young Life. And um, just, just so you know, they have their annual fundraiser, a banquet, um, each year. And it's going to be here tomorrow night. So there's still time for you to, to come to that. We just need to know that you're coming. Um, so you can go to our Next Steps area and ask questions on how you can make it to that banquet or how you can give to Young Life. Um, also, uh, if you know Angie Ellett personally, just let her know that you're coming to that. Each month, we take one thing to pray for for each of these ministries. So we're going to pray together for Young Life. This is what they're asking us to pray this week. Pray for more leaders and volunteers to walk into the world of high schoolers and teen moms. Like everything else, we need people to serve. Fitting, right? That's what we've been called to do is to serve. Maybe that's you. Maybe this is one of the ways that you can serve. You've already been thinking about it. God's already put it on your heart. And now, ha, voila, confirmation. You're welcome. All right? So let's take time, though. Let's pray for our... our um, our area here, this chapter of Young Life here, and Angie and her volunteers, and that more would come. So let's take a moment to do that silently, and I'll close this in prayer. Father, thank you for the volunteers. Thank you for Angie and Brad, and thank you for all the leaders of Young Life. Thank you for the work that they're doing. I pray, Father, you give them power to walk into what you've called them to. I pray that you give them favor in both with schools and with students. And God, with people who would donate, who would give. And Lord, for volunteers, we ask that you would send more. And I thank you, God, in advance for doing these things. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we do our benediction, uh, let me just want to say, like, we're about to have our partner meeting. And so, Asley is in the back back there. Asley, would you raise your hand, please? She's going to show us what to do. All the volunteers that signed up to transform this room, she's your leader. Look to her. She's going to tell you what to do. The rest of us, I know we like to linger, but we can linger in the lobby. So that sounds like a preacher phrase. Well, let's linger in the lobby, right? Uh, not in this, this room. This room is going to be transformed. Um, and with that, let's stand up for our benediction. Some people, as you notice, will hold their hands out. I uh, want to welcome you to hold your hands out for a pastoral blessing, a benediction today, which comes from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You are dismissed. Hmm?